Coming up on Business Incorporated. Kenya's Forex cash cow seeing remitting at least 20% more in 2022. The Egyptian pound calls its highest price against the US dollar in a month. Plus, Rwanda's central bank maintains lending rate to contain inflation. Great to have you join us. I'm Ladi Williams. Now, uh, we kick off with uh, market numbers, starting with Africa. Most of the markets we track here, see Nigeria's uh, main index was in the green, and then today marginally up by 0.04% down. Uh, South Africa's index had a bigger move. Uh, in the green, up almost 2%. Egypt's equities market closed uh, on Thursday. However, its index closed negative, uh, down by 1.63%, while the Nairobi Stock Exchange ended Thursday's uh, trading session in negative territory. And now to the Middle East, where major equities uh, we track there. See, the United Arab Emirates traded in positive territory. The Abu Dhabi index jumped by more than 3%, also to Dubai. Uh, index was up 1.94%. Still within the region, Saudi Arabia closed in the red on Thursday, down over 4%, while the Qatari index closed down 2.43%. Uh, Not a good afternoon uh, yesterday. All right, now let's uh, head on to uh, Europe. We have Chelsea Delady standing by uh, right there. Great to have you, Chelsea. Well, it's been a roller coaster. Right, for global markets this week and the volatility has forced investors in Europe to rethink expectations for tighter monetary policy uh, from the ECB. What are the markets uh, now expecting? Well, so the U European Central Bank has basically signaled to markets that it will hike interest rates in July. This would be the first interest rate increase since 2011. And there's pretty much agreement among even the most dovish members of the ECB that they must do it now to stop rising inflation. Uh, but what happens after that July interest rate increase is, is very unclear. Um, futures markets expect basically 200 basis points of interest rate increases through the end of 2024. So that's eight rate hikes in the next year and a half. Um, that has started to come down in recent days. Uh, investors are, are now expecting about two fewer than uh, at the start of this week. But actually what we're hearing from a lot of investors, a lot of economists, is that uh, it may not reach anywhere near that amount. And one economist um, that I spoke to thinks we'll just get three rate hikes uh, in the next year and a half. And, and the reason for that is because the European Central Bank is, is facing both high inflation but also a deteriorating economy. Most economists now expect um, the, the Eurozone to face recession in the next year. Um, so it, it will be quite difficult for them to, to keep raising interest rates throughout that because it would slow growth even further. So um, they're facing slowing wage growth and, and also higher energy prices from the war in Russia that will uh, further depress spending. So they have a very limited window to raise interest rates, uh, and, and many think that they won't be able to do that much further uh, past the end of this year. Quite interesting. But, but this reduced uh, ECB expectations is already having a big impact on uh, the euro. Analysts have been making some pretty gloomy forecasts for the uh, our currency's uh, value. Tell us more about this. Well, there have been some surveys out of investors. They a majority of investors now do expect um, euro-dollar parity. So that's the euro uh, and, and the dollar having basically the, the same value. That's something we haven't seen in, in 20 years. And right now the euro is trading at uh, about 1.04 to the U.S. dollar. So it is still worth a little bit more than the dollar, but it, it's lost about 9% of its value already this year. Um, Currency depreciation is definitely a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it makes exports cheaper. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if 
German companies are selling machinery or, or autos to the United States, uh, it becomes cheaper for those buyers abroad. So it can uh, help to boost exports, but it also increases the cost of imports. And, and that's going to be a big problem uh, given the fact that we're already facing very high inflation. It also uh, reduces spending power for you know Europeans who are traveling abroad. Their, their euros will no longer uh, reach, uh, they, they won't reach as far when, when they're in the United States, for example. So that's definitely something that it, it could likely weigh on consumer sentiment here in Europe. Right. And, you know, staying with currencies, the Russian ruble is now the best uh, performing currency in the world uh, this year. How is that possible? Yeah, it's a pretty shocking figure. The ruble is up 11% uh, against the U.S. dollar this year and actually 27% against the euro. Uh, so how does that happen when an economy is being really uh, hit hard by sanctions so what, what's basically the Russian government has done is, is shut down active trading on the currency market. They've also done with uh, this with the Russian stock market. So the Russian stock market is uh, has been quite stable despite the economic turmoil. The same is happening with the ruble. So it doesn't really reflect what's going on in the Russian economy. Um, Russia has been able to do this by imposing capital controls so people can't send their money abroad. They can't sell the rubles that they have. And they're also uh, forcing countries to pay for natural gas in rubles, uh, which has been obviously a, a big story here in the EU in the past couple of, uh, couple of weeks, whether countries will go forward with that. But basically what that does is increase demand for rubles and drive up the value of the currency. It doesn't really obscure the fact that the Russian economy is in a, rece and it is in a recession. Many economists expected to see the worst recession since the end of the Cold War. Many companies have abandoned their businesses in Russia. It's facing very high inflation. Uh, and there's also the prospect of further embargoes on Russian oil and gas. So the outlook for Russia's economy is definitely bleak, and it's not the best in the world, as that currency rate might suggest. Yeah, quite interesting uh, measures that are taken by the uh, Russian uh, Central Bank. All right, Chelsea, thank you so much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Uh, let's uh, move on now to the UK. We have Juliana standing by right there. Uh, great to have you, Juliana. So uh, the former Sainsbury boss, Justin King, is warning that the UK's golden era of cheap food is coming to an end, saying households should be prepared for higher grocery bills in the long term. Uh, still another bleak outlook there. Yes, it is another bleak um, outlook. Justin King has been speaking on the BBC uh, Radio 4's Today programme. And, of course, he's been talking about the, the, the topic that everybody's <clears throat> talking about here, which is the cost of living. Um, he was uh, the Sainsbury's boss. He's now a non-executive director of Marks & Spencer. So he's definitely got an eye on what's happening at the checkout. And he did say, yes, uh, that um, that uh, time is over the cost of um, having cheap of uh, food. It really began uh, when uh, the market share of uh, the European um, uh, brands such as Audi and Lidl came into the UK. Lots of people weren't really sure about shopping uh, with them, uh, first of all, but then they became accustomed uh, to the taste of the food and they really liked it. And the big four grocers, Morrison's, Asda, Sainsbury's, Tesco, did start price matching. So it was uh, competitive and people were able to get a decent um, meal for a decent amount of money. Uh, but of course, uh, because of supply chain constraints, the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, that has pushed up um, the cost of food. And he does believe that this is likely um, a sign of uh, times to come. He doesn't think uh, that the, the big grocers in the UK can uh, no longer cushion the blow of higher prices. Uh, but what's quite interesting is that the biggest two grocers in the UK, um, Laddie, which is Tesco and Sainsbury's, uh, they had uh, uh, pre-tax profits last year of over £2 billion. Some would say it's really hypocritical uh, for them to say this when, of course, they're making so much money. And again, it does bring up the whole discussion about a windfall tax because it's the same thing with energy bills. Energy bills are going higher, yet energy bosses are profiteering of people's uh, pain. So it's a very interesting um, discussion that's taking place. It's doubling down on what we heard from John Allen earlier in the week. He was also speaking on the BBC Radio 4 Today programme. Um, he is uh, the, the Tesco chairman. And he also said that he is starting to see that people are spending less at the checkout because the food is just costing so much at the moment. 
Right, all about rising cost of living uh, uh, right now. And it seems the prime minister is looking inwards to free up, you know, some cash to buffer the issue of uh, rising cost of living. And, and this may actually affect civil service jobs. You spoke uh, about that to uh, any on business morning. Yeah, this is a really um, a big story, which is likely to grow legs um, over the weekend. Um, yesterday, the Prime Minister was holding a senior cabinet uh, meeting in the Midlands to try and tackle the cost of living crisis. Lots of people up and down the country not happy that during the Queen's uh, speech and the reopening of Parliament, that not enough was done to tackle uh, this <coughs> emergency. Um, and one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways uh, the Prime Minister thinks that that can be done is by axing um, up to 90 thousand jobs uh, from the civil service. Um, and that is going to be a huge issue. And of course, 90,000 people. So most of us will know somebody that is likely to lose a job in the civil service. I think some people may have an idea of what the civil service looks like in the country, but it's not just people um, who have flashy jobs uh, writing speeches for the prime minister. Many of these people uh, are teachers, police officers. They're working in job centres, really trying uh, their best to help uh, people get on with lives. Uh, we know that uh, there was a huge recruitment drive during the pandemic um, to assist the government in trying to help buffer uh, some of the issues. And what the Prime Minister is saying is calm down. Um, in fact, uh, yes, a, a senior uh, a minister earlier this week, um, there's a meme going around with calm down. I'll have to let you go and Google that. Uh, but yes, the prime minister is saying calm down, um, that it isn't as bad as it looks because we did hire people before that. We want to go back to the numbers that we had uh, pre-pandemic. And according to the Treasury, this will save the government £3.5 billion every year. And that money uh, could go towards cutting taxes or trying to support people with emergency measures uh, to undercut the cost of a living. Uh, but um, yes, it, it, this is quite a significant amount of job cuts, 90,000. And I'm sure some people working within the civil service will be going home really, really concerned because, of course, nobody, especially at this time, Laddie, will want that awful letter saying that you've lost your, your job. Right. With, with, with rising cost of living, you don't want to lose your job <laughs> at this point. Well, earlier I saw the markets were rebounding. Some I saw the uh, crypto market and the U.S. and uh, Nasdaq. How's it looking in the U.K.? Well, yeah, the, the FTSE is actually trading um, in positive territory, although there's so many um, significant global issues taking place right now. I'm sure by close of business, uh, the, the numbers will be different. First of all, the, the, you know, the pretty awful news of the death of uh, the president of the United Arab Emirates, um, considering just how significant and important that economy is to the rest of the world. That is certainly going to have geopolitical uh, ramifications there. And then, of course, we had that news, didn't we? Elon Musk saying um, his Twitter deal is on hold. That is shaking up. Um, uh, Wall Street uh, right now, uh, but it hasn't. It doesn't seem to have affected uh, London, but I know it will by close of business. The all share is up 1.56 percent. The FTSE 100 is up by 1.66 percent. The FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's up by 1.28 percent. In the currencies market, the British pound is currently trading down on the US dollar by 0.06 percent, down two on the euro by 0.11 percent, but up on the Japanese yen by 0.47 percent at intraday, laddie. Right. Fingers crossed uh, for the uh, Friday close. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Juliana. Enjoy the weekend. All right. Now let's uh, take a look at what's happening in uh, Asia. We see shares in Asia Pacific uh, rose today with markets seeing the roller coaster week with investors um, at, uh, the assessing inflation and global economic outlook. The Nikkei 225 in Japan closed 2.64% uh, higher at 26,427 points, with shares of uh, Japanese conglomerate SoftBank Group jumping more than 12%, despite reporting uh, a record loss at its Vision Fund Investment Unit. The Topics uh, Index climbed 1.91% to 1,864 points, while South Korea's cost fee advanced 2.12% on the day to 2,604 points, while the S&P ASX 200 in Australia gained 1.93%, 7,000 points, while the MSCI's broadest index of Asia-Pacific shares 
outside Japan rose 1.95 percent. All right, so stock futures were higher uh, early uh, this morning as investors geared up for the S&P 500 to potentially slide into official bear territory. Well, uh, we have uh, our correspondent, Maria Bird, with uh, yesterday's close. We, guess we, we can't get that now. We'll get it uh, later on the program. Well, we'll take a break now. When we come back, more stories on the African continent. Do stay with us. This is Business Incorporated. <music> Welcome back now to our next uh, conversation. The war in Ukraine has dealt a major shock to commodity markets, altering global patterns of trade production and uh, consumption in ways that have kept prices at historically high levels. Well, we have Matt Kindigan now uh, join us to discuss the implications for Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, great to have you on the program, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me on the show today. Yeah, so how long do you expect global commodity prices to, you know, remain high? Certainly. So uh, our view here at Front of View is that commodity prices will remain elevated through the rest of 2022, and there is some risk of even more upward pressure uh, for the rest of this year and into early 2023. Uh, in, uh, in terms of what is driving this, so we, we do see uh, uh, the war in Ukraine being a major driver. Uh, Russia is one of the largest global exporters of many commodities, including iron ore, coal, and precious metals like gold and platinum. Uh, and given that the war in Ukraine is likely to last well into the end of this year, maybe into next year, we're going to see commodity traders look for alternative sources to reduce their risk of exposure to uh, the conflict for the foreseeable future. Um, we're, what we're going to see as well is even though there's going to be investment in mining capacity globally, it will take time for new mines to ramp up in terms of capacity and even the existing mines, uh, including in sub-Saharan Africa, will struggle to increase production to meet rising demand. So it, it's really a simple story of uh, demand really outstripping supply for the rest of the year. Yeah, it's quite incredible how much uh, commodities uh, Russia and Ukraine actually export uh, to uh, yeah. the world. But, you know, I remember, you know, sometime last year, there was this conversation about the commodity super cycle. You know, analysts kept on talking about it coming. And uh, did they see this war actually coming? Or was, was it something else that was indicating a commodity uh, super cycle? So uh, certainly, I, I don't think the war was anticipated by, by many people. I think it was not part of the base case for most analysts. But in terms of uh, higher prices for commodities, this really, uh, it was anticipated to an extent uh, by many analysts. Uh, and this is as a result of the global economic recovery that we're seeing. So um, as soon as COVID restrictions started to be removed uh, fairly early on, uh, after the first couple of waves of COVID by, by, by some countries, we started to see signs of very strong recoveries in economic activity, especially in Europe and the US, and also an acceleration in uh, demand for things like you know, renewable technologies, renewable power, uh, battery-powered cars, for example. So even uh, without the war in Ukraine, we would have seen increasing demand at a much faster pace for global commodities, especially metals. Quite interesting, regardless uh, of the war. But which countries stand to benefit most from the favorable outlook uh, for the uh, mining industry? Well, from a, a sub-Saharan African perspective, uh, I think we can uh, view, well, we can divide countries into uh, two groups. The first group is countries that will see immediate benefits from uh, very strong demand for uh, commodities, especially metals and mining commodities. Those include South Africa. So uh, South Africa, a very large uh, uh, coal exporter, iron ore exporter, exporter of precious metals. And in fact, we've actually revised up our GDP growth forecast for South Africa as a direct result of the stronger demand for its uh, metals uh, and uh, fuel exports. So certainly a very direct beneficiary this year. Uh, this will also affect or positively affect government finances in South Africa. We're certainly going to see uh, improved prospects for Z um, uh, Zambia and DRC. So big copper producers. Again, this is a result of, of much stronger demand for, for copper. We're also going to see more investment into both these markets, but especially 
uh, DRC as mining houses try to uh, get hold of uh, more um, ores uh, from both those markets. Mozambique will also see quite a strong immediate benefit because it is a very large co um, coal producer. Um, but the countries that will see benefits in the longer term, not necessarily uh, as quickly as other markets include countries like uh, Tanzania. We are seeing more interest in things like nickel mines in Tanzania. We're probably gonna see more investment there over the next couple of years. Also diamond mines in Angola are going to see a bit of an uptick in investment. And also West Africa, a very important source of um, uh, nickel, gold, and, and other metals. So uh, those countries will probably see a bit of a benefit, but not quite as immediately as other markets like South Africa. Right, and, and we've seen the U.S. dollar hit uh, new highs. And but, but yeah. how would you know strong demand for mining and metal commodities affect currencies in, in sub-Saharan Africa? Uh, so the um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the U.S. dollar being very strong. We have seen the U.S. dollar index uh, rise close to multi-year highs. Um, this certainly will weigh on pretty much every currency in sub-Saharan Africa. We're having to revise our forecasts for. Uh, sub-Saharan African currencies at the moment. And we we're expecting a bit more downward pressure uh, across the board. That includes countries that export uh, metals and, and mining commodities. But uh, for the big metals and mining um, uh, commodity exporters like South Africa, again, uh, we are expecting to see actually quite a, a strong currency. So even though there has been some downward pressure over the last couple of weeks as a direct result of the strengthening dollar, the fact that uh, there will be such strong demand for South Africa's um, exports means that the RAND will be supported to an extent. So certainly South Africa stands to benefit from uh, its status right. as a major, or well, the RAND stands to benefit. Um, right. We're also going to see um, the Mozambique and Metacal uh, also supported as a result. Okay, well, it'll be interesting to see how uh, the currencies uh, match up to uh, the uh, stronger moving U.S. dollar. Thank you so much, uh, Matt Kindega, a uh, practice lead, Top Star and Africa Front of View. It was great having you on the program. Great. Thanks, Ken. All right. So uh, uh, Kenya's uh, remittances, the East African nation's largest source of foreign exchange, is expected to grow by at least a fifth this year. A Central Bank of Kenya data shows Kenyans abroad sent home a record $3.72 billion uh, last year, 20% more than the previous year. And uh, remittances in the first quarter of 2022 already about a quarter higher than a year earlier. That's why remittances is a major source of foreign exchange for Kenyan for the Kenyan economy, accounting for about 20% of forex inflows. An Egyptian pound recorded its highest price of the month against the U.S. dollar, continuing to rise for a second day in a row. Dollar price recorded its highest uh, price since April 20th, slightly higher from uh, on Wednesday. The dollar recorded about 18 Egyptian pounds 30 on April 10th. The Egyptian Central Agency for Public Mobilization and Statistics uh, showed Monday that the consumer price inflation in, in, uh, in Egyptian cities uh, jumped 13.1% on an annual basis in April. And Rwanda's central bank has maintained its lending rate to tackle soaring inflationary pressures and support economic recovery. Central bank's uh, rate setting MPC uh, decided to maintain the rate at 5% unchanged from the last quarter to contain inflation and support economic recovery amid heightened risks, including rising domestic and global inflation. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thank you for watching. I'm Ladi Williams. Enjoy the weekend.